folks attend the uh, our not only our webinar but also our webinar series. So as as Ann also mentioned, this is part of a, a monthly uh, series that we do, and uh, we invite uh, any newcomers to to come back as we go through different uh, subject matters with our um, uh, throughout our uh, webinar series. Uh, that we do every month for for the whole calendar year. So, uh, and if you're returning, welcome back, um, and uh, we'll jump right in. I always like to give a little bit of an outline of how we'll move through the uh, the webinar presentation, uh, so folks know really the, the the topics and the subject matters that we will touch on. Um, we should have plenty of time for question and answer at the end. So, if for some reason I I didn't touch upon something that you want to know more about or need to have a question or clarification, please ask if for some reason we do run out of time or you'd prefer to have a conversation with me uh, out offline, particularly if it's about a, a specific project or something uh, more lengthy that may not be appropriate for the whole audience. The last slide will have my phone number and email and you can feel free to contact me at your convenience that way. So <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about um, just basic stormwater management just to put us all uh, just to frame the context here and, and put us all on the same page, I realize probably most of you uh, are stormwater professionals or work in this area, but it's it's important to really kind of lay the uh, the foundation to talk about how um, compost fits into this context, particularly for sediment control applications. And then we're going to talk about what, why, and how it functions. So if if you're new to this. You're, you've probably heard that, you pro I'm sure you've heard of compost filter socks and Filtrex <coughs> products, but uh, for most folks who are familiar with compost, but not necessarily how it works for um, sediment control or erosion and sediment control applications, this may be a, a pretty new concept or at least learning how and why it works, and we're going to spend some time on that. I'm going to talk about some of the um, um, specific research um, publications that are related to the performance of the filter sock and, and why it functions and how well it functions and how we're using this uh, a lot of this research in design and engineering criteria as well so uh, and then of course we'll have time for question and answer so <clears throat> uh, I always use this slide in, in a lot of my introductions for uh, for presentations, whether they're webinars or, or uh, in-person trainings, but uh, basically what this slide is showing you is as we move away from our greenscapes and natural landscape uh, systems to more urban environments, basically what happens is, is we're breaking the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle, and we're uh, <clears throat> we're preventing or retarding the ability of, of nature to actually cycle or recycle water, whether it's through evapotranspiration, whether it's through uh, infiltration and percolation through the soil, through interflow and groundwater recharge. And you can see what happens as we move from left to right in these in the way that we uh, change our land use patterns. We get rid of more vegetation, we get rid of really organic matter in our soils, we get rid of biomass, and we trade we trade that for more and more impervious surface. And you can see what happens if you look at the color coordination there. So, um, and there's the, the original graphic here is to show you that we're, how we're increasing surface runoff as we do this, or, or storm water. But in reality, we know that there's plenty of studies now that show there's a direct correlation between storm water runoff volume and pollutants. total pollutant load or, or massive pollution. So you can also look not only as the amount of storm water that we are creating or generating in these uh, urban environments, uh, but it's also, you can also look at it as the increased pollution load. And really we're here to talk mostly about sediment, but you could look at that, <clears throat> you could also interpret this as not only sediment, but also all types of stormwater pollutants from metal, heavy metals to nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, harmful bacteria, oil and grease, uh, all types of uh, typical runoff uh, parameters. But there's another reason why I'm showing you this slide too, and that is um, what's really neat about these natural systems, uh, particularly as you look to the left of the graphic, is as rainwater or any stormwater that's generated <coughs> uh, 
infiltrates down into the soil in the form of uh, interflow or what we call subsurface flow or groundwater recharge. When that happens, that rainwater or that stormwater actually gets naturally filtered in that process as it moves through soil particles and, and moves through the soil profile, whether it recharges our surface waters um, as it moves just below the soil surface, uh, recharging uh, rivers, lakes, and streams, or it goes down deeper and recharges our aquifers. Uh, that water gets naturally cleaned, and, and that what happens in that process is actually what we are um, is a service of nature and we're actually mimicking that service or really utilizing that service in, in more efficient terms uh, in using the compost filter sock and I'm going to explain more about that here momentarily. According to the US EPA, 75% uh, of the US population lives near a polluted water body. These are the chief uh, pollutants that are uh, listed both, uh, for, they're listed on their uh, impaired water body uh, list on their website or, or TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Load Listed uh, Water Body Segments. It just so happens that the very same pollutants that are polluting our water bodies are the chief pollutants that we find in our storm water. No surprise there. Um, but I've highlighted the first one, <coughs> uh, turbidity and total suspended solids. These are the result of clays and fine silt sediments getting into our surface water bodies. They tend to stay in suspension for a very long time, and they're the more problem portion of, of sediment. Larger sediments generally are not as much of a problem because they don't wind up, they don't stay in suspension, and they're very, very easy uh, to control. And, and, um, and erosion and sediment control terms. So and I've also highlighted here in red text the, the, the current number of stream segments that are listed for uh, sediment pollution related to high turbidity and suspended solids in the United States according to the US EPA. So <clears throat> I should differentiate here between um, construction activity, stormwater management, and post-construction. And when we talk about sediment control and um, uh, the use of silt socks, we're really mostly talking about using them for sediment control applications. I'm going to talk about post-construction a little bit later, and we have a separate webinar that really focuses more on the post-construction applications. Um, but why do we target only sediment, or mostly sediment, in construction activity? Well, number one, we don't have stabilization. We've cleared off vegetation. In some cases, we've moved around soil. Um, so we have a lot of disturbance. So because of this sediment relative to other pollutants that may be present in the soil or on the soil, um, sediment is by far the biggest load of pollutant because of that. Um, <clears throat> In disturbed soil situations where we do have a high degree of, of sediment loading, conventional wisdom tells us that other pollutants that are present attach themselves to sediment. So the theory being if you can get the sediment, you also get other pollutants that are uh, present or, or typically in the runoff. In post-construction, this is not true. Um, now, I know we're concentrating on sediment control and construction activity, but it's important to realize some of the differences here. In post-construction, where we do typically have stabilization, whether it's through impervious surfaces or vegetation, um, uh, whichever form that may be, um, sediment is no longer the chief pollutant. It's still, it's still a targeted pollutant in post-construction stormwater. But now we have to worry about all the other pollutants because they are in the soluble form, free-floating form, like nitrogen and phosphorus and fecal bacteria and metals and oil and grease. So some studies are showing that about 80% of the total pollutant load in, in post-construction storm water are in the soluble form. So uh, important distinction between the two there. Um, but according to the US EPA, sedimentation continues to be the number one source of water pollution in the country. So I think it's also important to talk about some of the, what we're comparing the silt sock to. Um, uh, more traditionally, it's been compared to silt fence or, or used where silt fence applications are, are present uh, for sediment control applications. Also straw bales, although you were seeing straw bales, I think, being used uh, less and less um, across many states um, uh, across the country. Uh, wood chip uh, mulch berms have often been used and still are to some degree. Uh, fiber rolls, sediment retention fiber rolls, uh, 
<clears throat> uh, are being used more and more uh, as engineered products uh, for sediment control. Straw wattles, um, obviously. Uh, active treatment systems, these are systems that uh, basically uh, channel, channel and direct uh, high um, pollutant construction runoff into a into a treatment system uh, where it actually gets filtered and uh, these can be very expensive very expensive to capital intensive to purchase very expensive to maintain they often use uh, energy and in many cases chemical treatment uh, to run these things so they, they are very limited based on the flows that they can handle and they can be, be very cost prohibitive as well um, it's important uh, note here that uh, the systems above as well as the uh, Filtrex system are passive treatment systems relative to uh, these active treatment systems. Chemical treatment is an option too. Sometimes chemical treatment is used within these active treatment systems. Sometimes chemical treatment is used within sediment uh, or stormwater ponds or even just broadcast uh, on the soil itself to help uh, coagulate and flocculate uh, uh, sediments that may exist. Uh, they're often even used in conjunction with some of these other uh, practices listed above. And then of course sediment and stormwater ponds where we're building uh, large containment systems to capture uh, stormwater runoff and allow sediment to um, to deposit uh, naturally and these are obviously very, can be very capital and maintenance intensive and take up a, a very large footprint as well. So uh, if we don't have to build stormwater ponds, uh, most folks don't, uh, would prefer not to. Um, if you're new to this, you may find this quite interesting, but if, you're, if you've been around uh, Filtrex and compost filter socks for some time, you, you probably already know this. But uh, basically, um, any federal agency that has the ability to um, approve and specify some sort of guidance document or specification for compost filter socks has done so. The US EPA has um, as part of their national menu of best management practices. The uh, uh, NRCS has, the US Army Corps of Engineers has, and, and so has uh, AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. And then also most of the state DOTs and state environmental protection agencies whether it's a DEP or state EPA or DNR also has some form uh, of specification or guidance materials for the use of compost filter socks. <clears throat> I showed you a slide that was similar to this at the beginning of the presentation where we looked at what happens when you change land use patterns. Um, but I want to show you this one because it takes it from the watershed scale down to the site scale which is where most of us do, do our work. Um, and again, I wanted to reiterate uh, how uh, how the compost filter sock is, is really utilizing natural systems and really ecosystem services and the services of nature to, to give us the performance it does. So I mentioned this. If you look at the arrow that's pointing down, 35% surface water detained and infiltrated. So this is showing that nature naturally does this in um, as it as it naturally manages stormwater and, and site hydrology. Uh, in green infrastructure context and in stormwater context, we often build bioretention systems and rain gardens and infiltration fields and zones to really uh, enhance this and, um, and uh, really increase the ability of nature to do this by digging shallow depressions and, and creating engineered media and allowing the this uh, surface water to get uh, not only infiltrate but actually get um, naturally uh, filtered or through biofiltration mechanisms. Well, uh, through the compost filter sock, we are actually able to do that above ground, which is actually really unique. Now, we're not using the compost filter sock to, to infiltrate, so thereby reducing volume, but we are getting that biofiltration uh, component uh, above ground without the ability of having to take up valuable land area footprint and uh, we also know that we are going to have some form of surface water runoff with 
pollutants with a variety of pollutants in them, whether it's high in sediment or other soluble pollutants, particularly in land development. Uh, this shows a natural landscape system with a low percentage of surface water runoff, but we know that uh, most of us are working in land development projects, and anytime you're going to develop land and you're moving soil around or reducing vegetation or putting in impervious surfaces, that 15% number is going to go up and there's going to be pollutants in it. And so if you can have something within that flow path to filter those pollutants, that would be a very good thing. <clears throat> uh, many of you may be surprised to learn that uh, there are actually 24 different um, stormwater management, uh, best management practices that all use compost, and I've listed them here. These are all the Filtrex compost uh, based BMPs. The ones on the left are for construction activity stormwater management. The ones on the right are for post-construction. And I've highlighted the ones in red that use the um, compost filter sock um, technology with uh, 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 with the biofiltration component, which I'm going to talk more about here momentarily. Uh, we have another presentation or another webinar that focuses uh, more on the post-construction aspects <clears throat> and some of the ones that I have highlighted that I have not highlighted here. So if you're interested in those, we have a, uh, another webinar in our series that concentrates on those. So what is this compost filter sock? So I've given you a, a bit of a photo panel here of a lot of the main uh, applications of where we're using it in sediment control applications from perimeter control of sediment to sediment traps to using it as a a uh, slope interruption device, uh, as a check dam, uh, even as a, a large sediment trap here as you can see, and even using it for uh, post-construction biofiltration applications. <clears throat> we actually have a lot of very um, detailed specifications uh, for the Filtrex SOC um, and, and actually a lot of design criteria too, but I wanted to highlight some of the key components that really help to differentiate it from a lot of other um, products and practices that are that are really in this segment or in this category. Number one, they come in a variety of diameters, 8-inch, uh, 12-inch, 18, 24, and 32-inch diameters. Um, and actually we have a, a new 5-inch sock uh, as well that, uh, that we are, are now producing. The weight <coughs> is actually one of the very unique characteristics and that is this is um, in some cases it is considered a weighted sediment uh, control device, but you can see here, um, starting with the 8-inch sock at 13 pounds per linear foot, that these are quite heavy. So this is, uh, this is one of the, uh, the great advantages and, and really lends itself to increased performance because of its weight, because once it's in place and then staked or anchored down, these things are very difficult to move. They are very porous, so they don't allow for undercutting, but because of their weight, they, they're not going to float, they're not easy to, um, to dislodge or move when runoff and sediment uh, comes upon the device, uh, and therefore also because of that, they don't undercut nearly as easily as some other um, devices, sediment control devices in this category. Related to that, uh, the flow, the flow through rate of these devices is actually really quite high. In some cases, they're considered a high flow uh, sediment control device. So you can see here, uh, starting with the 8-inch diameter sock at 7.5 gallons per minute per linear foot. And obviously that increases as the diameter of the sock increases. Um, so because these are quite porous and allow for very um, um, uh, quite high flow through rates, we don't get a lot of hydrostatic pressure building up behind these socks like, like similar devices do that don't allow very much flow through rate or, or flow at all. Uh, and because of that, these things act like a true filter and they are less likely to undercut uh, also because of their weight uh, and less likely to overtop as well. Another key component is the mesh opening size <clears throat> and that is um, uh, we've actually done a lot of research to determine what the optimum mesh opening size is here and, and really it needs to be between 1 8 and 3 8 of an inch um, for the sock containment mesh netting system that holds in the, the filter media. If you get above that 3 8 inch, basically it starts to get too, too open and too porous and it doesn't contain the media uh, as well as it should. And if you get below that 1 8 of an inch, uh, what happens is uh, you actually restrict flow through these systems and their ability to filter. So it begins to act more just like a, 
a, uh, a non-porous uh, straw wattle or really a silt fence. So basically what happens is water just dams up on the front end and you don't get a lot of the, the great biofiltration characteristics and flow through characteristics that I've been <clears throat> mentioning so far. And, and because of that, not only, not only is performance reduced, uh, but also design capacity as well. So you would actually probably wind up having to use more product to get the same results on a, uh, on a slope. <clears throat> so um, for all of these applications, for, for all of the Filtrex applications, we, we generally use uh, one of two types of media. We use a filter media or a biofiltration media, which you see on the left, and, or we use a growing media, which you see on the right. So if the intent of the project is to grow vegetation, we also use this for erosion control, but if the intent of the project is to grow vegetation, whether it's in the SOC system, or as part of a bioretention system or a uh, risk control blanket, we use the media on the right. Okay, but we're actually here to talk about sediment control applications and the Filtrex um, sediment control system and similar systems. And so we use the very coarse media you see on the left. Sounds a little funny sometimes when I hear myself say this, but a lot of research has gone on to determine the optimum particle size distribution of the filter media that we're putting in these systems. Um, because we want water to move through them, but we also want to trap sediment and other types of soluble pollutants. So there's a, a lot of research that's been conducted to determine this and, and been published in, in some, some of the uh, best scientific journals in the country, environmental scientific journals in the country. Um, but you'll also notice that a lot of the specifications, not only the Filtrex specifications, but also US EPA and RCS and a lot of the state specifications reflect this research and these particle size specifications. Very critical. If you're new to this, you're probably looking at these, at these pictures and thinking, wow, neither one of these look like compost that I'm used to using in my garden or in agriculture or in soil blends. And if you're thinking that, you're absolutely correct. And this is actually one of the key take home messages because if you're putting that media or you're a designer or a contractor or subcontractor and that media is going in the sock that you're using, you're going to get very low performance. It's not going to all the all the performance information I'm going to share with you is is null and void. So very important to get the specifications correct uh, to get um, the performance that that a lot of us talk about and and a lot of the uh, research shows as well as the um, design criteria for spacing and size of the stock. <clears throat> so to kind of bring that point home a little bit better and to and to describe it in a little more detail. What you're looking at here is what happens as you manipulate the particle sizes within the filtrex sock or compost filter sock. Looking at the bottom of the graphic here, particle size, so this is in inches, so as you move from a, uh, from a quarter inch to two inches, as more of those particle sizes increase, you can follow that blue line and see that the flow through rate, the water flow through rate is going to increase, um, but the filtration ability is going to go down. Okay, so if you have all coarse particles, you're going to have high flow through rate but low filtration ability. And if you go to the left where you have all fine particles, which is probably similar to what a lot of people think of when they think of compost, basically you're going to have almost no flow through rate, if any at all, but high filtration ability. Or really just the, what you're doing is you're blocking all the water and all the pollutants that are coming uh, up, up to the up the upslope side of the system, <clears throat> which is not what we want either. That's generally what a silt fence does, it's generally what a straw waddle does, and that's not what we're trying to mimic here. We're trying to have a, a biofiltration system. In fact, what we're doing is we're mimicking, mimicking what nature does in natural soil systems. We're also mimicking engineering-wise what um, what uh, engineered water filtration systems and air filtration systems do, like the, like uh, very similar to the air filter in your HVAC system in your home or air filter in your car. Basically, we manipulate the apertures or the pore space openings in those systems, and when you do that, as they get bigger, airflow increases, but we trap less um, particulates in the air and other pollutants that may be present in the air. And we we cinch down on those. Uh, apertures or those opening sizes and the flow rate uh, decreases, but the, the capture ability or filtration ability actually increases. Same concept, same idea. So now, <clears throat> as you think about that and how important that is to the function of these systems, you, 
get the idea that these filtration devices have got to use filter media and there's no better example than the, the one in the upper right hand corner of the photo here of the inlet protection sock. So when a lot of folks look at this picture they, they intuitively think the, the number one goal in this picture is to filter out sediments and pollutants before it gets into that storm drain. But actually that's the secondary goal. The, the primary goal still is to allow runoff water to get into that storm drain because we, are an imp we have an impervious surface here, we know we're going to create a high degree of runoff, and the last thing we want is to redirect that water or to pond up water in a situation that can lead to hydroplaning where somebody um, can actually get in an accident and either get hurt or, uh, or there may be destruction of, of property. So we have to be ever cognizant of that, and, and there's a reason why that storm drain is there, so we have to continue to allow that storm water to get in there. Secondarily, we want to clean it up. You can see the size of the great openings there. They're not going to do much more than to keep um, you know, large sticks and trash out. Um, so by putting the inlet protection device, we're really just taking it one step further in keeping certain size of particulates and sediments out as well as potential soluble pollutants. But we still want that water to get in there. So you can see if we have fine media in there, basically that's just going to create a dam around that, uh, around that storm inlet. One of the things that's really unique to um, the Filtrex system is its ability to provide a three-way biofiltration or filtration system. It's not just for sediment control, it's not just for particulates, it's not just for, um, uh, it's not just a physical means to uh, take pollutants or, part, or particles or sediments out of storm water. So yes, that is a, a component. I've actually spent a lot of time already talking about how we manage for that or design and engineer for that uh, through manipulating the particle sizes of the media. And because we do that, we create a variety of pore spaces and, and that gives us the ability to trap a variety of particulates and sediments. That's actually not unique to design and engineer of these types of products, although some, as I mentioned, just put in, you know, very fine media that don't allow for this to occur, but others do, um, and, and they do have this physical component, and this is, this is really kind of the first stage of designing for a, a filtration or biofiltration system. The second stage, and it's really these next two that start to make the Filtrex system quite unique, and that is there's a chemical component. We're not adding chemicals but we are using organic matter and there is also humus, um, a percentage of humus within these systems too. There's a lot of research <coughs> that's gone on over the years and, and actually the US EPA has, has promoted this as well quite a bit, but we know that organic matter and humus has the ability to sorb or adsorb soluble pollutants that we typically see in storm water and even soil systems themselves and actually take them out of the storm water. They'll attach themselves to the, uh, to the organic matter or the filter media that I've been sharing with you in some of the uh, in some of the pictures and actually take that out of the storm water. So this is the natural uh, filtration process and, and natural soil systems do this as water, storm water infiltrates down through them as well. This is what we're part of the natural system that we're mimicking here. Uh, ammonium nitrogen and some heavy metals are good examples of, of these pollutants. Um, there's also a biological component too and that is um, we know that compost media has a very high uh, um, degree of diversity as well as high populations of beneficial bacteria and fungi. In fact, even more so than in undisturbed natural soil ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> this has been looked at in a lot of different uh, research uh, papers and this is one of the reasons why the US EPA actually um, advocates for and has guidance documents on how to use compost for remediating polluted soils because of this, not only for the chemical but also the biological component. And these beneficial bacteria, they're not the same ones that are present in the composting process. They're a little bit different. But they do have the ability to, once we trap some of these pollutants, to actually transform them and degrade them into more benign forms uh, and then also plant available forms. Uh, so actually a little bit of bioremediation going on within the Filtrex uh, system here, which is, pr which is pretty unique. Um, <clears throat> I could have a, a fourth one here, and that is if we included plant materials, but particularly some select plant material um, within the system here, we can include a phytoremediation um, aspect here. So some of the pollutants that we're actually trapping within the system, 
then the plants would actually take some of this up into their, through their roots and into their biomass, thereby taking it not only out of the water, but also out of the filtration component, and, and then potentially um, increasing the longevity or the sorption capacity of the compost filter sock. <clears throat> Let's get into some of the research a little bit. So this is one of the first uh, research uh, projects and papers. This was done at the University of Georgia, published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation that showed that a uh, compost biofilter uh, used for sediment control uh, could perform better than a sill fence on disturbed soils, on construction site soils. Showed that uh, the compost biofilter decreased sediment loading by about 37% compared to a sill fence. But, um, but also, this is one of the first papers that showed that uh, these types of biofilters can reduce more than just sediment or filter more than just sediment out of the runoff. So this paper also showed that uh, it could reduce total nitrogen and total phosphorus by nearly 50%, nearly 30% respectively. <clears throat> the USDA Ag Research Service did a study comparing filter sock to silt fence. This is also published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation. But they specifically looked at the suspended solids and the turbidity fraction of the runoff. So that that uh, bit in the runoff that really stays in suspension and is the hardest fraction to uh, to take out or to reduce or to remove. So they found that the filter sock uh, reduced suspended solids and uh, turbidity significantly better than the silt fence did. And you can see the percentages there in the in the table. Another study done at the University of Georgia, also published in the Journal of Soil, Soil and Water Conservation, compared uh, two different size compost filter socks, 8 and 12 inch diameter, and compared them to wood chip filter berms and straw bales. And what we found in this study, uh, two things really. Uh, one, that the compost filter sock is performing better than these um, other uh, organic based systems, a straw bale. Um, I think you you could probably put a straw waddle in this category, uh, as well as the wood chip filter berms, um, significantly so. And you can see the percentage uh, TSS reduction, total suspended solids reduction here in the in the graphic. But we also found that going to a larger compost filter sock doesn't mean better water quality or more filtration. Um, in fact, the only reason to go to a larger sock um, is to handle more runoff or greater drainage area. Um, uh, so that was one of the unique um, uh, answers or, or questions that was that was, that was uh, answered in this study or that we learned in this study. This is a study that was done um, at San Diego State University. They're one of the uh, few uh, have one of the few labs in the country that can perform ASTM test methods for erosion uh, and sediment control materials and products. They compared the filter sock to silt fence and a straw waddle. And you can see here over to the right the percent removal efficiencies for, for total sediment uh, over to the right. What's actually really unique is I've shared with you a variety of studies here from different areas of the country using different sediment loads, different sediment concentrations, different sediment types, sand, silt, clay, um, and uh, different methodologies. But what we're seeing is the, the performance of the filter sock in all of these studies is near 80%. A little bit more, a little bit less, but kind of averaging out to about 80%, which is pretty pretty interesting. This is um, part of a study that uh, the USDA did. They wanted to take the the suspended solids fraction, so the very fine sediment, and separate it out into um, percentages of clay and silt, because um, these are the these are the fine these are the portions that lead to suspended solids. They're the hardest to get out. Um, chemical wisdom has told us, or chemical, sorry, conventional wisdom has told us that we need um, either to have some sort of chemical treatment or we need to have long sediment deposition times through ponding uh, or containment systems in order to take out these very fine sediments uh, and so, they can, so they can settle out. Um, so what we wanted to do is see how well the compost filter sock and biofiltration system was working uh, on these finest of sediments. And what we found was um, we're, we're removing about 60% roughly of the clay fraction and about 75% uh, or so of the silt fraction. Um, and, and I have in the actual particle sizes split up for both clay and silt here at the bottom of the table there in, in micrometer. So you can see how, how very fine these are. <clears throat> I don't have, I, we haven't included the uh, sand fraction here because sand usually doesn't contribute to suspended solids uh, very much, if at all, and it's extremely easy to take sand as a form of sediment out of stormwater runoff.
Um, the USDA ARS also did a study, and this has been published jointly in the Journal of Environmental Quality and Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, on how the compost filter sock filter tracks technology worked for pollutants aside from just sediment. So you can see the suspended solids and turbidity reduction here on the left uh, end of the uh, performance table. But the rest of these are all soluble fraction, um, soluble fraction of the stormwater runoff. So this is more important for your post-construction applications um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and we actually have another whole webinar presentation based ar around this, and it's really led to our EnviroSoc uh, technology that we use for uh, stormwater compliance in the post-construction uh, world. But you can see here from total nitrogen, uh, from nitrogen species, phosphorus species, uh, total and E. coli, uh, total coliform and E. coli, range of heavy metals, oil and grease, the uh, performance of the compost filter sock <clears throat> and the filtrack sock on these uh, specific pollutants. We actually work closely with the ARS to develop some natural additives to increase the not only the performance but also the longevity and capacity of the Filtrex um, system to target each one of these types of pollutants. And this is what has led to our treatment train additives and really what we call our EnviroSoc line of products. And there's another presentation where we focus on that. This is a study that was done at uh, the Ohio State University, published in the Journal of Environmental Quality. This was based off of one of the studies that the USDA did, where they found that the, on average, the compost filter sock was flowing uh, water, uh, storm water, about 50% faster through the system than a silt fence does. And it really wasn't part of the objectives of that study, but it was one of the things that we found through that study. Well. Engineers at the Ohio State University thought that was pretty interesting and, and said, well, we probably need to look at that a little bit closer because if water is flowing through these systems, through the, the compost filter sock system faster than a silt fence, then the way that we design and space them needs to be different. And really up until this point, we had just used the same sizing and spacing criteria for compost filter socks as we had for silt fence. Uh, so <clears throat> what this study showed us is that they also found the exact same thing that the USDA found, and that flow through rates are 50% faster for the through the socks than for silt fence. And so what this means is, is if we're using the same spacing criteria, then the, the compost filter socks only need to be uh, half the height in order to handle the same uh, runoff design capacity as a silt fence. So what that means is a 12-inch compost filter sock is equivalent design capacity to a 24-inch silt fence. And an 18-inch sock is equivalent to a 36-inch silt fence. Uh, research scientists and engineers actually built a, um, a, a very user-friendly design tool um, that folks can use uh, for very challenging and specific projects to uh, put in their uh, site and design conditions, rainfall conditions, uh, design storm conditions uh, as well, <clears throat> and, and in real time compare the silt sock and a silt fence and their ability to handle the um, design capacity or, or potential scenario on that site and can play with a variety of user inputs here to, to make sure that they're choosing the right size sock for or for, or even silt fence for their project. And the, what you see the uh, steps one through seven are the user inputs and then down here in the yellow uh, lets you know if it's actually in compliance or not. Uh, we've actually made this much more easier for folks and we've built design tables that we have in our specifications for uh, for a variety of uh, design storms based on your area. So you don't even have to go into this uh, design tool. You can use these spacing tables and charts, which are actually a lot more efficient to use. <clears throat> for those of you who use the um, universal soil loss equation or the revised universal soil loss equation, um, we've actually developed uh, uh, not only P factors, but also LS factors uh, that you can plug into the um, universal soil loss equation or, or, or Russell as well. So obviously in this equation, this is a linear equation. When you're solving for A, basically what that is is the um, total uh, soil loss on a potential site. This is originally developed by the uh, USDA for agriculture, but it's used more and more on construction sites these days where R is the um, 
rainfall index, K is the erosivity of the soil, LS is the length and the steepness of the slope, they put that together. C is the um, conservation management practice, uh, or often what we call C factor, and uh, we have developed C factors for erosion control products across the industry. And then P is your support practice factor, um, and uh, folks have developed P factors for various sediment control technologies and products and practices across uh, the industry as well. So you can actually use slope interruption socks uh, to reduce the LS factor. And, any, and anytime you reduce any of these uh, factors, you're reducing A, which is the total soil loss off the site. So by reducing slope length, um, which you can with a slope interruption sock, you can actually reduce that number. Uh, there's book values to help you do that. Uh, for the compost filter sock, what we've done is basically taken the average of the uh, of a lot of the published studies here, and so the p factor, the way you determine a p factor is really the inverse of its um, removal efficiency compared to a bare soil, basically without using the compost filter sock. So your your p factor would be approximately 0.25, and you'd actually just plug that right into the equation here. Sediment trap design um, is uh, is actually um, uh, one that's been getting a lot of uh, a lot of use, particularly I'd say in uh, the eastern half of the United States, and they're using it to supplant uh, earthen uh, sediment berms and, and earthen sediment traps. And there's actually some pretty unique advantages to using the sock for this type of system. So. Uh, for those of you who are kind of familiar with sediment traps in the in the design world, um, sediment barriers are really the the smallest form of sediment control, often used for sites of of one acre or less. Um, then we move up to sediment traps, which are often allowed to be used for um, sediment control for for five acres. Uh, or less, and then when we get up above that, then we start to get into sediment ponds and sediment basins. So, um, so sediment uh, traps have the ability to handle, you know, much more drainage area, more runoff. They generally only allow for sediment deposition because they're berms. There is no porous component to them. But that's where compost filter socks and using the socks to to build them into a larger um, uh, device like you see here, what we call our pyramid uh, design construction configuration, where we get much larger design capacity out of them so they can be used. They're obviously very heavy, not easy to move. We actually don't have to move soil around which in and of it to, to make the berm, which in and of itself is a land disturbing activity. Uh, why would we want to have a land disturbing activity in order to make our sediment control device? That never made sense to me. So, uh, so you don't have to move soil around. And also because these are porous structures compared to the, compared to the ones that we're replacing, they actually can re can reduce the footprint of what the, the size of the BMP. So we don't need to design them to contain every ounce of water that comes to the device like an earthen sediment trap does because these are porous. So because of that, um, because water will move through these, uh, they can actually be reduced uh, in size and footprint, which can be very beneficial not only to reduce ponding on the site so you can move equipment around better uh, after rainstorms, but also um, to increase the speed of construction sequencing as well if you don't have these you know, big berms uh, in the way of your equipment or, or waiting for uh, water to, to infiltrate down or evaporate. Um, <clears throat> so lots of, uh, lots of advantages to this. So um, if you're interested in more of the details and specification and design criteria of a lot of these applications, uh, Forrester Media publishes a book called The Sustainable Site and Design Manual for Green Infrastructure and Low Impact Development, which goes into uh, very good detail on a lot of the different applications that, uh, that I've been talking about here that use the compost filter sock and other applications that use compost media but maybe don't use the sock, um, like some bioretention systems and um, uh, other types of systems that uh, may or may not use the sock system. So uh, I invite you to look into that. You can see a, a snapshot of the table of contents here. You can get that through Forrester Media. You can get it on Amazon. Um, I think Filtrex can help facilitate get copies of this for you as well if you're interested. So with that, that uh, concludes the, uh, the meat of the presentation. Uh, we, I think we have some time for question and answer if, uh, if you guys have some.
I appreciate your time. Yes. Hi, Britt. We do have some questions before I pose that. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that those specifications that Britt mentioned in the sustainable site are also available uh, on our website. Uh, if you go to Filtrex University and scroll down, you'll see a link to specs and CADs. And you can sign up for our design manual there. And, and you'll have 24-7 uh, access to those um, specifications and CAD drawings that you can easily drop into your uh, project plans. Um, if you're looking for generically branded non filtrex then you'll want to look at the sustainable site and not the design manual. So that's my shameless plug for yeah, visiting our website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question from Kenneth. Is the configuration of a concrete washout area made with compost sock a reasonable design? And are there any chemical reaction concerns between the concrete wash and the sock? Um, good question. Um, it, it, that is one of the um, uh, main BMPs that we use the sock for. And you'll actually see its own uh, specification and design chapter there in the manual that I uh, mentioned. And we have those specs online, too, as, uh, as Ann mentioned. Um, so it is a good use. Um, in terms of reactions, um, there, there's no uh, um, negative reactions that it will occur. The One of the beneficial reactions and there were two of the beneficial reactions are that um, one, you you're going to help create um, maintain uh, sediment and the particulates within the um, within the sock system and within the design of the system, which is partly why you're doing it. But compost filter media also has the ability to buffer pH, so concrete washout can really have an extremely high pH, um, generally anywhere from I've seen this anywhere from between 10 and 14 on the pH scale. So the compost filter media actually has the ability to, I'm not going to say it's going to get it down to, to 7 as it comes through there, but it has the ability to buffer it, which means that it can help reduce it if it's high and increase it if it's low. Um, and actually by adding our metal locks additive through our EnviroSox, actually that, you, that will actually increase the ability of that to occur uh, as well. So something to look into there. There are no further questions. You, Somebody else had a question, but you answered it. Okay. Uh, so if anybody else has a question and you don't have time to feverishly type it into the question pane, you can also use the hand icon. You can raise your hand if you have a microphone or you're connected to us via telephone for the audio portion and you have the ability to speak into the microphone or phone to pose your question, you can simply raise your hand and I'll call on you that way as well. Anybody? You always do a thorough job presenting, Brett. <laughs> I've noticed over the years you get fewer questions, so I think that people are um, learning through the website and other improved resources they come with. Um, and you've gotten better and better at presenting. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> if there are any final questions, do pose them now. Otherwise, we will um, conclude the broadcast. I'll give a, a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, comments for you all. I wanted to remind you that we will be sending you a certificate of attendance that you can use to claim one PDH. And we will make the slide deck and the recorded session available on our website should you need to provide additional proof of content. And that will be available at filtrex.com slash webinars. You can scroll down to this webinar title, and on the right side, you'll see links to um, those um, items I just mentioned. Also, I um, want to uh, let you know that we have several upcoming webinars. On uh, July 1st, we'll be talking about pollutant removal, which Dr. Fawcett mentioned a few times in today's broadcast. Uh, we'll really dive deep into the pollutant removal technology of the compost filter sock with those additives um, that absorb pollutants. So we'll get into that. On July 15th, we'll be talking about vertical living walls and fences. And on August 5th, we'll be diving deep into our green locks living wall system in particular. Um, the vertical living walls and fences are, um, these two presentations will be geared uh, toward landscape designers, uh, and um, the green locks will be very oriented to stormwater managers. 
Um, that's a system that's great for stream banks, so I encourage you to attend those sessions. Um, or you can find the, the full year schedule on that page as well. Um, I don't see any further questions, uh, Britt. So uh, let's see. Yeah, that was it. Um, no further questions. So I want to thank you very much for presenting once again. Um, I invite the audience to contact you with the information on the screen if they have any follow-up questions. And do please um, look for that email with the certificate, and there will be links in there to easily register for these upcoming sessions. So we hope to see you there. Thanks again for coming, and this concludes today's broadcast.